if there's a time for anybody to go ahead and be humble and maybe reach out for some help, even if it's like for a one-time thing and just make sure that you're okay, I would say now is definitely it. Now's not the time to dig your head in and, and, and the sand and bury it there and leave it there and just hope things are going to be okay, um, whether you're doing it by yourself or with another advisor. Welcome to Retire Smarter with Kevin Krosky. Find answers to your toughest questions and get educated about the financial world. It's time to retire smarter. Hey there, and welcome to another edition of Retire Smarter. Walter Storholt here alongside Kevin Krosky, President and Wealth Advisor at True Wealth Design, serving you throughout Northeast Ohio with offices in Akron and Canfield. You can find us online by going to truewealthdesign.com. And Kevin, we have no shortage of things to talk about from the stock market and the coronavirus pandemic fallout that continues throughout our country to now a stimulus package and bill that we have lots to discuss. So much must be running and swimming through your head these days trying to keep it all straight and and figure out how to navigate all these waters. I know you're probably kind of enjoying the challenge of it all, uh, but uh, what's the last couple of days been like for you? Well, I guess on a personal level, if we could start there briefly. So, you know, certainly I think everybody's spending more time with their family, at least, you know, that family that's within their household. And uh, last week was a, <laughs> just a huge week in the Krosky household. My six-year-old daughter, Aubrey, uh, still had training wheels on her bike. And, uh, you know, we've been getting a lot of practice just kind of in the front uh, of the house and in, in not only doing the training wheels, but we had a little scooter for her, kind of a little pedal scooter just so she could learn balance. And then that clicked for her. And uh, you know, we had the pedals off. We had the training wheels off the bike, and I took the pedals off so she could use it more as a strider. Uh, and as soon as I saw her get the um, get the scooter down, I was like, you know, it's time. I think she got it. And uh, she's a more of a cautious person. It's her nature. And I told her, I said, you know, Aubrey, when, when Daddy was little, and I was probably five, we had, a, we had an alley uh, behind our house. And it's where I learned how to ride my bike. And I remember, I mean, it was big pothole filled alley and my dad just shoved me down the way and kind of sink or swim and you know bloodied knees and scraped elbows later you know eventually I, I got it but um you know I, I was holding on to her and she she didn't fall once so she got going she was she just to see her smile and see her face light up uh was just fantastic so it was huge week she also lost one of her front teeth last week uh, it was Ooh. a bit of a collision with uh, my uh, year and a half year old daughter and um, they were just playing and wrestling, but her tooth was really loose. And so the tooth fairy came last week in the Krosky household. She rode a scooter last week and then rode a bike. I mean, just a lot of, you know, coronavirus Those aside, are a lot of big milestones. All at once. It was a big positive week in that regard in the Krosky household. So maybe we can, I wanted to share that and try to kick things off with a bit of a positive tone. And um, my first bike ride was straight into a tree. So I think I, I was with you on the uh, hop on. Dad gave me a really strong push and then right down the hill into a tree. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure we didn't have, I, I know I didn't have a helmet on back then. Um, you know, now it's like the helmets, you know, not only on, but mom makes sure it's like extra tight and you know, almost strangulating the, the kid uh, out of protection <laughs> concerns. And it's just a different world that we live in these days for sure. I think I did have the helmet. Not sure if I had the knee pads and arm pads and all the rest of it, but I, th I do think I had a helmet strapped on. So my nickname before that moment, and it still is to this day, is accident waiting to happen. So my, <laughs> my parents were well prepared by the time the bike came out that I would probably need a little extra protection. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So uh, not only did we have a positive week in the Krosky household last week, but uh, when we were recording the podcast uh, last week on a Monday, it was a Monday morning, the Federal Reserve had just come out with really unprecedented kind of support to the markets and, and try to correct some liquidity issues that we mentioned last week. We'll talk probably talk about a little bit this week as well. And so we were just really just digesting this before we started recording. And what you saw happen last week was that really provided uh, some support to the markets particularly to the credit markets. You know, the Federal Reserve doesn't go out and buy stocks, um, but what they did uh, historically, they buy treasury obligations, obligations of the U.S. government, whether it's kind of short term or longer term. And um, so they've always done that, uh, but they started buying municipal bonds. They started buying corporate bonds, investment grade corporate bonds, assets that they typically have not purchased in the past. 
There was also some special um, other kind of facilities, if it's kind of what they're called, to buy some other sort of credit instruments, um, more securitized debt. I uh, really won't get into that. It gets fairly technical. But it, w- if we were looking at the returns, so say we were recording a week ago, Monday, and we were looking at returns for the fixed income assets for the prior week. Really what you saw were municipal bonds, and these aren't you know kind of uh, you know junk high yield municipal bonds, but, you know, there was kind of like an aggregate mix. Municipal bonds were down 7% in a week. Uh, U.S. corporate bonds were down nearly 9% in a week. Uh, The aggregate bond benchmark, which is really common and probably everybody that has a 401k has a similar option to invest in within that 401k was down um, nearly two and a half percent. So that's, you know, roughly about half uh, treasuries. There's a lot of mortgage bonds in there too, and then corporates as well. Um, So, We mentioned this last week, but this is just something that's really important to keep in mind, uh, and we'll kind of set the stage here as we move on as for why. But whenever stocks go down, you generally expect bonds to hold up and uh, to kind of counteract that. Well, this liquidity crunch, you know, basically people were just selling whatever they could, um, whatever was most liquid, whatever had fallen the least in value or, or held its value, starting with treasury bonds and then kind of moving down in some of those corporates and municipal bonds, what have you. Basically, they weren't selling stocks um, by and large. Um, what you saw within the mutual fund industry over the last couple of weeks, the outflows from bond funds compared to stock funds, orders of magnitude greater for people selling bond funds. And so it really created this liquidity crunch. Um, and you saw these fairly high quality assets, uh, whether again, whether it's you know U.S., agency, you know, really high quality mortgages, treasury bonds even um, had negative returns on some days that the stock market sold off a lot. These high quality municipal bonds, it just, I can't remember that happening in 2008. Um, One of these, you know, days when I have a little bit more time, I'm going to go back and do some additional digging. But the real high quality stuff is supposed to hold up and be that ballast to your portfolio whenever stocks sell off. And that didn't happen. But when the Fed came in, uh, on Monday morning, they they had done some prior things previously, but basically they came in and said, "Hey, we're going to do unlimited asset purchases. We're going to expand what we can buy, and we're going to bring liquidity back to the market." And that has definitely happened. So if we here we are, uh, as of you know this week uh, for March thirtieth, you saw the stock returns up 10%. Um, a large, I, I would deduce, I would argue that a lot of that was just from the Fed kind of restoring liquidity to their credit markets and kind of filtering through the whole financial system. Certainly with what Congress did uh, and the president signed in a lot later in the week certainly helped as well. A lot of that news had already been kind of priced in as well. Um, but when you look back over the last week, you saw bonds kind of rebound quite quickly. Other bonds, uh, maybe less uh less liquid, uh, not as high quality of bonds, still are some taking some time to work through some things. You're still seeing some issues in certain parts of the mortgage market, uh, but it's just been really unique. So, you know, we were recording this a week ago, stocks were down about 15%, U.S. stocks. Recording this a week later, the market went up more than 10%. So not only were things good in the Krosky household personally for, for my kids, but um, certainly it was a really good week last week to be a stock and bond investor as well. It was interesting to be one of those out there trying to refinance their home over the last two weeks or so and thinking, you know, definitely falling into that trap of, oh, interest rates, they're slashing them again. Let's let's go all get mortgages and, and refinances. And, you know, then talking to the mortgage lender saying, well, well uh, hold on a second. Actually, rates went went up. And then <laughs> there were a lot of people disappointed by that, that fact and, and a quick lesson in how uh, that side of the world works a little bit for many of us. Yeah, you're, you're going to see, I mean, you're already seeing mortgage rates come down uh, and they're going to continue to come down. One of the kind of quick tangent to this, you know, we own mortgage uh, bonds in our portfolios, in, in the bond portion of, of our portfolio. And um, when you look at, uh, this is a little bit technical, kind of a quick wonky alert, I guess. But whenever you look at uh, everything in the bond market is measured really as a spread to treasury. So a spread meaning, say, if treasuries uh, of similar maturity of, say, I don't know, um, say 10 years were paying 1%, for a U.S. government bond and a uh, municipal bond was paying 1.5. Well, there's a half a percent spread or corporates could be a higher spread, so on and so forth. 
where we're at right now, the spread of agency, high quality, you know, kind of triple A mortgage bonds to treasuries has been the highest of all time. And when you look at mortgages, the way that they're structured, there's different protections basically for these high quality uh, mortgage bonds. But going back into 2008, which was really kind of a real estate and debt crisis, a financial crisis, like we talked about last time, high quality mortgage bonds, you know, didn't lose any money in 2008, by and large, if you look at kind of the mortgage, high quality mortgage index, if you will. So it, some of these dislocations, we'll talk about this in upcoming episodes, but the changing market conditions are certainly providing a whole slew of things that we need to be doing and considering. Certainly, you know, first and foremost, again, <laughs> you got to stay disciplined. You, you can't be reactive. You can't panic out. You got to have a plan and you need to stick to that plan. And this is really when you need to step up and execute. Uh, down 15% two weeks ago, up more than 10% last week. You know, who knows? I certainly don't think this is going to be over anytime soon. Um, certainly, the markets are probably going to continue to be volatile for a while. I would say that's going to be more pronounced in. Uh, the stock market and the equity markets rather than in the bond markets, which are providing, receiving that direct support you know, from a Fed. But whenever you see these kind of dislocations uh, between prices, like the mortgages and the treasuries that I mentioned, you know, part of prudent asset allocation is, you know, hey, look at these forward looking expectations. These are high quality bonds. They seem to be, you know, giving extra compensation for risk at this point in time. Maybe we want to own more of it. So maybe we need to go ahead and, you know, kind of tweak our mix tweak our uh, ingredients and tweak our recipe a little bit to go ahead and have a better allocation on a forward looking basis. But that's really what's been um, taking really all of my time over the last couple of weeks. I mean, the, the market conditions were really changing not only on a daily basis, but uh, you know, intraday basis. And um, there's a lot of things that we needed to do in the office you know, some of those things, and I'll just mention them kind of in, in a list format today, but we're going to dive into these over the coming weeks and, and just really utilize some case studies for client work that we're currently doing to show how this actually works in practice. I mean, this is this is it. You know, this is kind of uh, our, our, the last podcast was this is not 2008. I don't think it is for all the reasons I described. However, when you look at how the market reacted in times of uncertainty, it, you know, it always discounts things sharply. And so, you know, you have to plan for that. And then most importantly, you have to execute through that. So we're going to be going over all these things over the coming weeks. But a lot of the things that we're looking at right now, Certainly, you know, again, changing allocations, changing market expectations, going ahead and making sure that uh, we have sufficient, you know, cash and good high quality bonds in the portfolio to really have a uh, bridge or have a runway for our clients that are taking uh, distributions from their accounts for their retirement income. We did a lot of tax loss selling in the portfolio over not last week because, uh, again, the markets have rebounded quite a bit and we had been doing rebalancing really all the way through. Um, but, you know, stocks had sold off by about 30%. You know, some stock markets even more than that. Uh, real estate market, uh, you know, similar to that as well. And so when something goes down, you know, you sell it, you book the tax loss in a non-retirement account, and then you buy something, you know, similar, not identical, but similar uh, to go ahead and realize that tax loss and then move forward. Um, you know, doing that certainly helps. It's going to save you on taxes for your 2020 tax year. Uh, there's all kinds of other planning that we can do around that, uh, that we will talk about moving forward as well. Some of the other things that we're doing, uh, we started executing for a lot of clients, um, you know, in the fourth quarter last year, Walter, you may recall, we did, you know, a couple episodes on fourth quarter tax planning and Roth conversions are certainly one thing that we've been long proponents and fans of. Does that ring a bell for you, Walter? It always does. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you. Uh, and um, really, we wait to the fourth quarter to do that. However, you know, stocks sold off about 30%. Whenever we're doing those fourth quarter projections uh, and kind of looking at current year, we're also looking at, you know, the next year. So we're doing that in the fourth quarter of 2019. We're looking back over 2019 and ahead to 2020. We really have kind of a budget for, you know, how much we're planning to do in a conversion in 2020. Uh, but generally speaking, we would wait until the fourth quarter of this year to do those conversions, moving the money from an IRA over to the Roth, you know, paying tax at a, a known and likely lower tax rate today versus what the client would otherwise pay in the future. I'll give you one client example briefly, but this client, we were planning on doing about $120,000 moving from uh, his IRA over to his Roth IRA. 
Well, stock sold off about 30%. So we're and certainly it could sell off more. Um, you know, so we are not going to wait until the fourth quarter. We're going to do it in a couple of chunks. And so, you know, we're doing about a $50,000 chunk, uh, this week. Uh, we did another, uh, we're planning to do another $50,000 chunk of the 120. So that gets us, you know, 50 and 50 is a hundred. So a hundred of the 120. And, uh, we're going to go ahead and do that soon and then we're just going to leave a little bit of buffer uh, before we get into to year end so you know it's a pretty sizable conversion that we're doing you know if we were just going to do say ten thousand or something like that i'd probably just do it once and be done with it uh, but because it's sizable we're going to you know try to average it out a little bit you know we're not going to pick the best spot we're not going to pick the worst spot but by and large we're doing it at prices that are appreciably lower um at least versus what they were just several weeks ago so you know, certainly we've been tweaking the portfolios. Um, we've been doing the tax loss selling. We've been accelerating some Roth conversions uh, for clients. We also are relooking uh, at uh, Social Security for several clients. So, uh, and this may be on surface a little counterintuitive uh, for some. And we've talked about Social Security in some prior episodes, and we've always been big proponents of delaying it as a general principle, um, subject to applying it to a client's unique circumstance. Uh, but whenever you think about Social Security and, and the delay that's involved, um, you know, there's an opportunity cost to that delay. So if you are going to go ahead and say, hey, Social Security, don't give me the money, you know, now at, say, 66, I'm going to wait till 70. Well, you're going to have to use more of the money that's in your account uh, to go ahead and provide the income that you're going to need to bridge the gap between 66 and 70. Well, the opportunity cost, say a year ago, was significantly less than what it is today because stocks have sold off a good bit. Um, so, you know, when we an analyze this, we would use some sort of assumed rate, a fairly conservative rate for that opportunity cost on the order of around 3% or so. Well, for a lot of clients, uh, we are increasing that rate and re really rerunning these analyses. Uh, so if you are investing in stocks and have a more stock dominant portfolio, then you probably have a higher opportunity cost or discount rate to go ahead and, and run that analysis. If you are a very conservative investor, delaying Social Security is probably still going to make a lot of sense because interest rates are so very low now that your opportunity cost for not investing in bonds probably isn't all that great. So, you know, there's several things that have been keeping us busy. Portfolio work was really kind of first and foremost, um, making sure that people still are on track. If we need to adjust any spending, we're going to be diving into this again over the coming episodes. But a lot of uh, to do's, you know, tax losses, Roth conversions, uh, Social Security delay and kind of you know, reanalyzing that. Just a lot of things that have been on our plate. Uh, but these are all the things that we talk about. We've done you know nearly 50 episodes, podcast episodes on these topics now. And, you know, this is really when all those ideas all those strategies really come together and just what has happened provides uh, an inordinate amount of opportunity to go ahead and make sure not only we're we planning properly, but we're taking advantage of the opportunities that have been presented to us as a result of this recent dislocation. So whether you know you or your advisor are kind of handling things, certainly our clients, I mean, we've been doing all this work for them. We've been reaching out to them, letting them know what to expect. And we're just kind of working through it uh, on a day, day by day basis. But, you know, if you're not working with us, these are the things that really you or your advisor should be doing at this point in time, because, you know, otherwise you're just kind of sitting down and kind of going to ride through it, but you're going to miss a lot of opportunity. Well, I just find this interesting, Kevin, because, you know, I I've talked with a couple of financial advisors over the past few weeks. And one of the questions that I've asked each one of them is, what are you doing for your current clients like what's the it's one thing to talk about you know it's two different conversations what are you doing for somebody who doesn't have a plan in place you know what's the plan of action for those folks who maybe have you know suffered big losses and are, are struggling to prepare now that we've had the big market downturn and we have all this uncertainty and then the other side of the equation is what are you doing for folks who you already have a relationship with and i've been amazed by how many times the answer has been basically nothing you know, not really doing anything, just waiting for it to go back up or or may kind of default to, well, we didn't have to do anything. So it's interesting to hear you kind of from a completely different angle of 
well, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're, we have all these opportunities, we have chances to look at this. I mean, you kind of are searching under every rock to make the most of, you know, the situation that's kind of in place in front of us. So uh, is that just part of your philosophy, the way that you build plans, or is that just every advisor should be doing this kind of stuff? It's just rare that teams are actually going out there and making these consistent changes and tweaks and, you know, betterments to the plan. Yeah, Walter, I'm grinning right now. Um, you know, <laughs> honestly, I wish I wish all advisors and advisory firms were doing it because the things that we're talking about here, I mean, frankly, these are in the no brainer category. All the stuff with the tax losses, with the conversions, we're talking about prudent planning. We're talking about science based, process based, empirical planning. Uh, and these are things that we have control over. We don't have control what the market's going to do today or tomorrow or next week. But we have a plan in place and we have a process and we know how to execute for several clients. We'll talk about this uh, again in coming episodes, but for several clients that have a lot of capacity for risk, they have a lot of ability to go ahead and take risk. Uh, we sent out an email to uh, around a third of our clients, about 60 clients or so that's saying, hey, we should really reconsider you know, your current allocation and, and consider increasing risk and, and do it in a prudent fashion. We'll talk more about how we are going about doing that for people, but we've been executing that plan for the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, certainly we look pretty smart right now, but it wasn't a market timing call. It was a process based call. It was more of a kind of a prudent thing to look at for certain clients that could do that. For other clients, on the other hand, that maybe don't have as much safety margin, that don't have the kind of risk capacity to go ahead and increase risk, well, we're looking at their spending plans and, say, and just really saying, hey, you know, how impacted are you? You know, what was your travel budget? Because pretty much everybody's travel budget went to zero now for at least you know, for the next several months. Um, and so, you know, do we need to make any changes to your spending plan? I mean, frankly, these are the things that clients pay us to do and to worry about, to just tell them to say, turn off the news and, you know, it'll come back. I don't think that's wrong. I just think it's it <laughs> it falls way, way short of what a good advisor should be doing for his or her clients um, to make them make sure that, you know, they're staying on track to make sure that, you know, frankly, that they're earning their fee uh, and that the client's getting a return on what they're paying for. I mean, it's just I, I don't know. I mean, again, I, I like to say that we dot the I's and cross the T's. I don't think we're anything special. Um in a way, but for whatever reason, we seem to be special and maybe the bar has been set pretty low, but these are the things that we're doing. These are the things that, you know, have, uh, it's a no brainer. Again, it's just proper planning. These are things that everybody should be doing and thinking about. These are also things, if you're not working with somebody, one, I would be, if I was working with an advisor, I would be asking them, you know, what are you doing? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? You know, Hey, I listened to this bald guy talk on the podcast and he <laughs> said he was grinning, but these are the things that he's doing. Uh, you know, why or why not? Does that make sense for me? And you know, if you don't get a good answer, then call us and you know, get a second opinion. But if you're doing this by yourself, you know, it's, uh, I just hope that you're, you're really navigating through this in a prudent way. Um, I can tell you that nobody's immune to feeling the emotions of any sort of panic or fear or uncertainty. Um, I mean, I've, Frankly, I hope it's been uh, noticeable through the podcast in the last couple of weeks. I mean, I feel, I don't want to say I feel overconfident. I, hopefully I'm not, but I feel very clear on, on the direction that we need to go and what we need to do for our clients and how we're going to navigate through this and we're executing. Um, so, you know, if, and I can tell you, I did not feel that way in 2008. I think 2008 was different, but frankly, I also had a lot less experience back then and I hadn't gone through something to the extent that that was, and that at least up until a week ago that, you know, we seem to be in now again, things are different, but you know, the kind of the magnitude with how quickly things went down was the quickest on record. So that was historically unprecedented. Um, so, you know, I talking to other advisors too. I mean, I mean, I can just see the ones that are less experienced that, you can just kind of feel it. You can sense that they, they don't know what to expect, that this is scary. And I'm not saying that it's not, but again, it's kind of like we, you dust off, you always have the 2008 playbook in mind. That, that, that's really our stress test that we have for portfolios and for somebody's retirement plan. But I mean, this is when somebody needs to step up and execute. And, you know, even if you have a professional person that, you know, may not know how to do that, if you're doing that on your own, you know, it's, if there's a time for anybody to go ahead and be humble and maybe reach out for some help, even if it's like for a one-time thing and just make sure that you're okay, I would say now is definitely it. Now's not the time to dig your head and in, in, in the sand and bury it there and leave it there and just hope things are going to be okay. Um, whether you're doing it by yourself or with another advisor, you know, we're, we're going to try to make this as concrete as possible. We've, people hire an advisor because they, they know, like, and trust them. So, you know, if anybody's been tuning in, 
we give a lot of content here. If it's something that makes sense to you, uh, if you know, you've got to know me personally a little bit, there's four CFPs that we have on staff. We have capacity to help additional people. We had more than a handful of people reach out to us last week. Um, you know, people need help now. People need leadership. People need to be shown a plan of how they're going to get through this and how they're going to be okay. And that's what we're doing. And, and if you don't have that, then give us a call. We're here to help. We, this is really when some, people, you know, you, your family, people that you care about need help because if they don't take proactive action and make sure that they're doing the things that we're discussing, they may not be okay. You know, again, I've seen people panic out in 2008 and sit out of the market for, for years and miss tons of wealth creation and not being able to go ahead and retire when they wanted to or having to spend less. I mean, these are the life-changing things that are going to be happening as a result of what we're going through right now. And you know, that's why we're in business. We're here to help people navigate through that, to keep them on track and make sure that they're going to be okay. Well, it's easy to get in touch. As we mentioned all the time here on the show, you can call the old fashioned way. 855-TWD-PLAN is the number. That's 855 855- Eight nine three seventy five twenty six. You can also go online to truewealthdesign dot com. That's truewealthdesign dot com. Click on the "Are We Right for You" button to schedule a fifteen minute call with an experienced advisor on the True Wealth team. Just go to truewealthdesign dot com, and we'll put all the contact information that you need in the show notes of today's episode. So, whatever app you're using to listen, just check the show notes, and you'll see the different ways that you can get in touch with Kevin and the team at True Wealth Design. And just because we, Kevin, just looking at some stats, we've certainly picked up, I think, a lot of new listeners over the last couple of weeks as people are just obviously more in tune to finances right now, especially if it's a coronavirus-related topic. Um, I know we've got a lot of new listeners tuning into the show now. Um, and, and so I probably will ask you this each week, just in case it's the first episode somebody's hearing. Uh, what do you look like operationally right now? Can you give us a quick recap of how you're meeting with folks, how you're helping folks? Is it in person? Is it uh, mostly digitally right now? What's your latest on uh, on that front? Sure. Um, so you know, we've been having conducting remote meetings for you know, more than five years as clients have you know, migrated out of state. Um, we are kind of I guess, by state at this point, you know, having offices in Ohio and Florida. And uh, so working virtually is not a problem. We had uh, a few of these uh, meetings last week with clients uh, over Zoom. Um, You're hearing, I never thought I would hear my 64-year-old mother say Zoom before, but um, but she did last week. And so, you know, (laughs) it's, you know, this is obviously going to change our culture and our lives, um, not just for now, but there's going to be, you know, on a forward-looking basis. Um, We'll we'll talk more about this down the road after we kind of get through it, because I think it'll be some interesting conversation on, on those outcomes. But we, we can certainly have an initial phone call. We can have you know a Zoom meeting. It's real easy. You just have to go to a website. You don't have to download anything on your computer. Um, so we can see one another and, and get to see the body language communication, which is so much of it and so important as well. We had a few of those Zoom meetings last week, and we're in a relationship business. Um, so people, one of the reasons why people hire us is oftentimes because we are local. I mean, certainly we have some clients that are out of state or some people that work with us remote, but a lot of people prefer to have somebody that's kind of in their their, their backyard and that they can stop down in the office. And we are an essential business, essential service in, in Ohio, so we are still open. Uh, we can maintain social distancing in the office. Uh, and we had a few people that had Zoom meetings that do want to move forward and, and work with us on an ongoing basis. And frankly, uh, two out of the two last week wanted to just pop down the office and, and just kind of meet us briefly in person before, uh, you know, they transferred over, you know, really their life savings over to the custodian that we use. So, you know, we don't hold a client's money. The custodian holds it. The custodian like Fidelity, Schwab, TD Ameritrade. Um, we use a too big to fail bank that's about 10 times the size of any of those. Um, but, you know, they hold the money and then we direct it on behalf of the client. So, you know, we've been doing this for a long time and we can go ahead and meet the clients or prospective clients wherever they are to help them. Well, again, if you want to get in touch, you can go to truewealthdesign.com or give a call to 855 twd Plan. I'm curious uh, to end today's show, Kevin, on a lighter, funnier note. Um, I just had the experience of, you know, all the all the salons and uh, you know haircut. I just call them haircut places or barbers or whatever whatever term you use to call where you go to get your haircut. Uh, I was seriously needing a haircut, and then everything closed down. So I've I've really been struggling. So we finally bit the bullet, and uh, my wife buzzed my hair this weekend. 
let me tell you, it uh, it did not turn out well. So, <laughs> and uh, it looks even worse when I'm trying to do a video chat. So I was teach. I taught my parents. Speaking of Zoom, I taught my parents Zoom the other night, and it only took like two minutes. They figured it out pretty fast. So that was, a, you know, certainly a, a a very easy program for them to kind of understand and, and poke around with. So that was great. Uh, it is a good tool to use. And um, but I'll tell you what, the, the hair looked even worse. In Zoom, so I'm curious. Since you are not shy of talking of your baldness, does it look better in person, uh, or does it start to look worse when you get on a Zoom call or a video chat, or does it the shine help it a little bit more? You're, you're asking me about my bald head. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> I, I I couldn't be the judge. I see it every day, so it's nothing special <laughs> to me. But um, but yeah, you. Uh, I, Walter, I'm not even sure how to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if you look in the camera and go, "Oh, the fisheye lens makes the uh, makes the baldness look even better today." <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, anyway, uh, we we can help people through video if they don't want to see a shine on a bald head or or what have you. Or you know, we've had some people that you know that we see, frankly, you know, kind of bring it back down on the runway here, Walter. But you know, we'll show people us, but sometimes they're at home and uh, they just don't want to kind of mess with their camera and get on. And that's fine too. We certainly, again, body language is, I think about half of communication. So I think it's really important uh, to see one another. There's actually been studies that have been done that after you have a video meeting um, and people ask like a week later, it has kind of a similar effect of having kind of an in-person meeting. So they're not perfect. You know, there's still some, a lot to be said about kind of getting together belly to belly, but certainly we have to be smart given what we're going through and, um, and we're well equipped to do it. So, uh, we, we reached out to, uh, about 60 clients to schedule their progress meeting here last week. And we always have an option for people to kind of select whether they want in person or for web. And we kind of let them know that, Hey, we should probably just schedule, you know, the web, and then if things change or clear up and we can get together in person, um, but, you know, just let us know what you prefer. And we had, um, I think we've had about, I don't know, 20 or 30 people schedule their meetings already. And the vast majority just picked a web meeting. So, so that's, you know, our current clients are defaulting the same thing. It's just kind of the, the reality that we're living in right now. Um, but regardless of what your expertise is on uh, kind of a zoom, I mean, we can do a phone call, we can do zoom, not a big deal. We've had our IT people actually help uh, clients uh, before as well with their own personal stuff so we can see one another. So whatever it takes, we're here to help. Very cool. Well, again, 855-TWD-PLAN, the number to call, or go online to truewealthdesign.com and schedule a 15-minute call with an experienced advisor on the team by clicking the Are We Right For You button. Well, Kevin, thanks for the information today and the help. Hope you have a great rest of your week. Looking forward to hearing about more milestones in the Krosky household. We have a bike ridden and a tooth lost. Who knows what the next week will bring for you? <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Thanks so much for being with us, and thank you for listening to today's show. Uh, much more coming up on the next episode, so come back and join us on Retire Smarter. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to the show on your favorite app so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and many other popular podcasting apps. Just search for Retire Smarter with Kevin Krosky. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you soon, right back here on the podcast. Thanks for listening. Information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Information is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accurateness and completeness cannot be guaranteed. All performance reference is historical and not an indication of future results. Benchmark indices are hypothetical and do not include any investment fees.